the Rock and Roll Unravel Show. I'm Derek Shelmerdine. Welcome to another Rock and Roll Unravel Show. On the 12th of October 1969, Detroit DJ Russ Gibb was presenting his radio show on WKNR when a mystery caller rang in and suggested he played Revolution 9 off the Beatles' White Album. And he specifically suggested that what Gibb should play was the repeated number nine, number nine, but play that portion backwards. Well, he hunted out the track and he played it. And what his audience heard live on air was Turn Me On Dead Man, Turn Me On Dead Man. This was where it all started. We're taking a look at the greatest urban myth in rock and roll history. Paul is dead. The conspiracy theory is that Paul McCartney died in a car accident in 1965 or 66, the dates that do vary a little, and he was replaced by an imposter. And after that, the Beatles built in clues in their song lyrics and album sleeves, and even songs played backwards. Now, more than 200 so-called clues have been identified. Many of these are really interpreting the lyrics to fit the conspiracy. There are three main sort of elements of the myth. One, that Paul died in a car crash and was replaced by an imposter, Billy Shears. The second is that the whole thing is just a hoax, perpetrated by the Beatles and or their record company. And the third, which is most often put forward, is the clues are all purely coincidental, all 200 of them. There was no imposter, there was no hoax. Now there's a comprehensive companion blog for the show and lots of the clues on the album sleeves and artwork are illustrated there and also links to the backward tracks so you can listen to these as often as you like plus links to other websites and newspaper articles. Now you'll find the website at rockandrollunravel.com and that's the unraveled spelling with two L's. So check it out, listen to the show, look it all up on the website and make up your own mind. Now to get us in the mood, there were even some songs written about the Paul is dead myth. And one of the more interesting ones is Zacharias and the tree people with we're all Paul bearers. Now Paul is there spelt as you'd expect P-A-U-L and this is Zacharias and the tree people. We're all Paul bearers. Well, let's take a look at the myth itself. What's supposed to have happened to Paul that day? Well, he left Abbey Road Studios in a bit of a huff. He just had a bit of a contretemps with the other Beatles. And he picked up a hitchhiker, Rita, and as he was driving along, she realized who he was. <laughs> Polly became rather overexcited, leapt on him, causing basically the car to skid off the wet or icy road that was his Aston Martin and Paul was killed and more specifically he was decapitated. Several dates have been suggested for this catastrophe. The most common date suggested is Wednesday morning at five o'clock the 9th of November 1966. Now the Beatles were afraid that without Paul they'd lose popularity and to prevent this they persuaded the police and the press to cover it up but somehow the Rolling Stones were in on the on the secret. A look-alike competition was organized to find a new Paul and it was won by William Campbell. Now he underwent plastic surgery to look like Paul and became Billy Shears. Now there are several contenders for Billy Shears the usual one is William Campbell, and you get different permutations of his name. William Campbell, William Campbell Shears, William Shears Campbell. In fact, William Shears Campbell, brackets Billy Shears, has his very own page on Facebook. There's a link on the website I mentioned earlier. And in it, he describes himself as being, quotes, born into an underprivileged family of 10 in Liverpool on the 15th of November, 1953. Now there's another account of William Campbell, and that comes from Fred Labor's famous article he wrote in the October of 1969, much more about this later. 
And when he wrote the article, he basically wrote it as a spoof, and he admits that he made up several of the clues in the story itself. And one of the things he made up was the identity of Billy Shears. He suggested the name William Campbell, but he suggested the origin was an orphan from Scotland. Now, there is another contender, and that's Bill Shepherd, also known as Billy Pepper. And he was the lead singer with Liverpool group, Billy Pepper and the Pepper Pots. Now, they released an album in 1964 called More Mersey Mania. And if you want to track that down, you'll find it on the Allegro label with the number AWL699. And that includes a couple of Beatles covers on the album, Please Please Me and She Loves You. Now, William, Bill Shepherd, is actually a songwriter as well, and he gets most of the songwriting credits for the other songs on the album. Billy Shears was introduced to Beatles fans in 1967 on the Sgt. Pepper album. And at the end of the title track, it seeks into a little help from my friends and quite clearly says, so let me introduce to you the one and only Billy Shears. Well, Bill Shepard's a definite contender for Billy Shears. And from that 1964 album, More Mersey Mania, this is what he actually sounds like. This is Billy Pepper and the Pepper Pots with their take on She Loves You. You're listening to Derek Shelmerdine with a Rock and Roll Unraveled show. We're looking at the greatest urban myth in rock and roll history. The idea that Paul McCartney died and was replaced in the band by an imposter. But before continuing with the story, there's an opportunity to win a signed copy of my book, Rock and Roll Unraveled. Just check out the link on my homepage, rockandrollunraveled.com. That's with two L's, remember? Answer a simple question and you're in the draw for a signed copy of the book. Now, Rock and Roll Unravel tells a story of rock and roll from its roots to mid-1970s punk. And Record Collector magazine, in their review, described the book as comprehensive and invaluable. Well, good luck with the competition. Now, I mentioned earlier that Paul McCartney said to have died on the 9th of November 1966. And it's often said that the Beatles died on the day that John Lennon met Yoko Ono. Well, oh, here's a spooky one. On the 9th of November 1966 was when John met Yoko. Now Yoko was already an established avant-garde artist and she was holding her Unfinished Paintings and Objects exhibition at London's prestigious Indica Gallery. And John was a friend of the gallery's owner, John Dunbar, and he decided to go along. Now the first denial that Paul had died was actually in February of 1967 in the February issue of the Beatles book Monthly Magazine, a British publication. And there was a very short article denying that Paul had died in a car crash on the 7th of January under the heading of false rumor. It suggested that the 7th of January, and I quote, was very icy with dangerous driving conditions on the M1 motorway. And then went on to say, a rumour swept London that Paul McCartney had been killed in a car crash on the M1. And then wanted to confirm that, quotes, absolutely no truth in it at all. Paul was home all day with his black Mini Cooper safely locked up in the garage. Now, the first time that the conspiracy theory appeared in print was on the 17th of September 1969, in the very unusual setting of a college newspaper, the Times Delphic in Iowa. That was the student newspaper for the Drake University. And Tim Harper wrote an article called, Is Beatle Paul McCartney Dead? Now he wrote it, he says, just for entertainment purposes. He didn't expect it to be taken very seriously. And the information came from his college friend, D'Artagnan Brown, who was the associate editor of the Times Delphic. Now, D'Artagnan Brown was a well-respected musician. In 2011, he was inducted into the Iowa Rock and Roll Music Association Hall of Fame. He said he heard the story from a musician who was passing through, and he'd heard that Paul McCartney had died, and the Beatles were building messages into their albums. And that unknown musician who was passing through apparently heard it from another unknown musician out on the 
west coast so the origins are all a little bit misty now a couple of weeks later sort of end of september in the uk and beginning of october in america the abbey road album was released and a couple of weeks after that on the 12th of october 69 it was when Detroit DJ Russ Gibb famously played Revolution 9 backwards on his radio show WKNR and that was really the catalyst for the conspiracy theorists and for our next song I thought we might just take a little peek at Revolution 9 from the White Album not the whole song it's about nine minutes but just to get a flavor of the track we'll listen to the first minute and a half or so this is where it all started we're actually playing it forwards so we'll hear number nine, number nine. And this is the Beatles with Revolution 9. So, Russ Gibb received a telephone call on his radio show WKNR. A mystery caller told him to play Revolution 9 backwards. And his audience heard, turn me on, dead man. And a conspiracy theory was born. Interestingly enough, in 2004, American magazine Goldmine, that's the American record collector equivalent to the British record collector magazine, they published an article by Beatles historian Bruce Spitzer, and that was titled Paul McCartney Admits Beatles' Planned Death Hoax, and he talks about how the hoax was perpetrated, and in it it suggests that Paul McCartney instructed his longtime associate and friend Mal Evans to go to Detroit and tell some college kids about the clues and suggested that one of them phone the local radio station, which obviously seems to be what had happened, but beware. The article was published on the 1st of April 2004, April Fool's Day. But the real consequence of this radio show was that a guy called Fred Labore heard the Russ Gibbs show that evening and he was actually in the process of writing a review of Abbey Road for his college magazine Michigan Daily he heard the Revolution 9 message turn me on dead man and it inspired him to check out the rest of his Beatles albums to find more clues perhaps Paul was dead so instead of a review of Abbey Road he actually wrote a spoof article and on the 14th of October 1969, that was published under the title McCartney Dead, New Evidence Brought to Light. Now, he actually wrote the article as a college prank, and he made up a lot of the clues for that particular article, including the name William Campbell, the supposed identity of Paul's replacement, Billy Shears. But Fred Labore decided that uh, William Campbell's origins were that of a Scottish orphan. Well, the article may have been written as a spoof, but it was taken very seriously. It was picked up by national news, national television. Life magazine even sent a reporter to interview McCartney at his farm in Scotland. McCartney did describe the conspiracy theory in that article as all bloody stupid. As a result of this, Fred Labore was actually invited onto a mock trial style TV show. And on the 30th of November, 69, he was on the F. Lee Bailey show that was hosted by celebrity attorney F. Lee Bailey. And the expert witnesses included the Beatles ex-manager Alan Klein and Paul McCartney's ex-girlfriend's brother, Peter Asher. That's of Peter and Gordon fame. And in the discussion, they, they talked about hidden messages and particularly the I buried Paul at the end of Strawberry Fields. Now, Alan Klein suggested that when John said I buried Paul it was because on that particular take of Strawberry Fields John's guitar buried Paul's sound. No talk there of it being cranberry sauce that was actually said. Now John Lennon in an interview actually corrects the interviewer and says that it was cranberry sauce that he actually said and that interview again is on the website so if you want to hear that portion with John's correction just check out the website rockandrollandravel.com but what's interesting to note is that the I buried Paul comes from the released Strawberry Fields single and the cranberry sauce comes from the Strawberry Fields outtake on the anthology album and so much talk of Strawberry Fields let's hear it this is the Beatles and this is the original UK 45 version of the Beatles Strawberry Fields. Listen out at the end 
for that famous I buried Paul but you might need to turn your radio up because it's actually said quite quietly so when you're getting towards the end hit that volume control put it on 11 and this is the Beatles Strawberry Fields forever let's have a look at some of the so-called clues on album covers and artwork now TV and movie cops are always saying I don't believe in coincidences and it's interesting to note that all of the coincidences involving artwork and backward tracks only ever refer to Paul and only with albums since Revolver this is just a oh, fraction of the so-called clues check out the website uh, for a whole lot more and to to see them for you for yourself that's rockandrollunraveled.com now if we start with yesterday and today that was an American album didn't have a release in the UK but, but that was the one with the notorious butcher cover which depicted the Beatles in aprons with raw meat strewn across them and there Paul has a decapitated doll on each shoulder and he's holding a decapitated doll's head now if you remember Paul's supposed to have been decapitated in the car crash now there was a very negative reaction to this particular sleeve as you can imagine it was withdrawn and replaced by the trunk cover now Paul can be seen inside the trunk whereas the other three are all outside of the trunk and the thing about this sleeve is if you turn it through 90 degrees it looks as though Paul's in a coffin now on revolver Paul's the only one shown in profile but the interesting point is that there's a small Paul basically crawling out of his ear and remember Paul's a beetle so it's like a beetle crawling out of a corpse's ear and then if we take Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band cover Paul's depicted uh, quite differently in a number of ways on this and other references to Paul uh, the flowers spelling out Paul for instance but the way he stands on the front cover he's the only one standing front on to the camera and on the back cover which is the really interesting one he's the only one standing with his back to the camera not only that but his head is directly under the without you part of the within you without you song title in the song glass onion on the white album John sings here's another clue for you all the walrus was Paul now that's a reference to the magical mystery tour sleeve the walrus is dressed in black and the other three are in white and in the booklet it shows the four beetles in tuxedos with flowers in their lapels Paul's is black and as you guess the other three flowers are red and on yellow submarine Paul's standing with a hand above his head and he, the symbols also on pepper and that's often considered to be reminiscent of a religious blessing Abbey Road has the famous zebra crossing sleeve where they're dressed as a funeral party John preacher in white Ringo undertaker in black Paul barefoot representing a corpse and George always draws the short straw as the undertaker in denim but interestingly Paul is exactly out of step with the other three all four have the heel of one foot and the toe of the other on the ground at the same time now this is not the shot of four people walking naturally across the road or once again is it just a coincidence that Paul is out of step with the other three and of course Paul's holding a cigarette in his right hand Paul was left-handed and on let it be the last album to be released the cover is really quite a subtle one it's a black cover with a head and shoulders shot of the four of them John George and Ringo are looking to the left and the photographs have white backgrounds whereas Paul well he's looking straight ahead but interestingly his background is blood red now each example it's trivial in itself a coincidence maybe but it's always Paul that's depicted differently to the other three Beatles now fans were introduced to Billy Shears at the end of the title track on Sgt Pepper and this is that title track for Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band there are so many clues on the Sergeant Pepper album 
One of the more famous ones is the run-out groove on side two of the album. That's the bit after all the music finishes. Now, this was only on the UK vinyl release. And when it's played backwards, this is the one that says, Will Paul be back as Superman? Now, the front sleeve itself is very much like a, a funeral scene. And the bass drum, if you hold a mirror to the centre part, Lonely Hearts, you get the image of 111XHEDIE. And if you take that as 11 as November, the month, IX, Roman numerals for nine, you get November 9, he died. Mind you, that is an American date format. If you take the same thing, 11 9 in British format, you get 11th of September. And that takes us to a whole new conspiracy theory. And the yellow flowers, of course, at the front of the sleeve spell the letter P or spells Paul question mark. Looks like a bass guitar, but interestingly has three strings, three sticks across it. And then there's the Shirley Temple doll, of course, with the sweater emblazoned with Welcome the Rolling Stones. The Stones are supposed to have been in on the secret. And the model of the Aston Martin at the doll's foot. It was an Aston Martin that Paul McCartney supposedly died in that night. And the grandmother figure that Shirley Temple is sitting on has a bloodstained driving glove on the left hand. All very strange. The White Album. If you drop the needle right after the track, I'm so tired, spin it backwards, you hear the words, Paul is dead, man. Miss him, miss him, miss him. Abbey Road, as well as the famous Zebra Crossing with Paul out of step, the way they're dressed and the cigarette, you've got the Beatle in the background, the VW, with the registration 28. If, once again, slight anomaly, he would have been 27 at the time. But on the back cover, you've got the skull. Now, the Beatles themselves really did perpetuate the myth. In November 68, on the White Album, John has the Glass Onion track where he sings, Here's another clue for you all. The walrus was Paul. And the relevance of that, of course, I mentioned earlier, Paul's dressed in black on the cover of Magical Mystery Tour. He's the walrus. The others are all dressed in white. Now, Paul McCartney's first album is actually one of my favourites of the clues. 1970, simply called McCartney. The front cover depicts an empty bowl with cherries scattered around it. And the bowl and cherries are on a white strip against a black background. Now, there's a very well-known saying, life is just a bowl of cherries. Now, this bowl is indeed bereft of cherries. And again, 1973, Ringo on his third album simply called Ringo, in a John Lennon penned track, I'm the Greatest, the lyrics include, My name is Billy Shears. You know, it has been all these years. Billy Shears, of course, is the guy most commonly referred to as Paul's replacement, the imposter. In 1993, Paul released a live album and the sleeve parodied the zebra crossing Abbey Road sleeve with Paul on exactly the same crossing and another VW in the background. But this time, instead of the registration being 28 if, it's 51 is. And the title of the album, Paul is Live. One of the songs that's said to have some good clues in the lyrics is She's Leaving Home from Sgt. Pepper. Wednesday morning at five o'clock was the time she left home. Paul supposedly died on a Wednesday at 5 a.m. And later on in the song, it refers to uh, meeting a man from the motor trade. Yet another reference to automobiles. And this is The Beatles with She's Leaving Home. Well, this has been a look at the greatest myth in rock and roll history. Did Paul McCartney die and be replaced by an imposter? Let's pull the whole thing together now the theories one was there an imposter billy shears two was it all a hoax or three was it just 200 or more coincidences now the imposter theory there are plenty of websites with proof that paul died and was replaced by billy shears they point to the lips the eyes the ears and other things as the differences between the two pauls 
And if you take the third option, coincidences, there was no imposter, there was no hoax. And that's always the answer presented by the Beatles or their establishment. Now all good TV cops denounce the idea of coincidence as the solution to anything. And the coincidence explanation always points to the fact that loads of other photos, outtakes existed, which didn't have Paul's back to the camera, crossing the road out of step, sounding like I buried Paul or whatever. But what's really interesting is none of these alternatives ever made the finished product. They always ended up on the cutting room floor. And to me, that is the biggest coincidence of them all. Given that the three solutions are theoretically possible, I think the imposter theory is highly unlikely. I also tend to think maybe 200 coincidences is just a tad too many to explain it all away. If you look at the clues from the perspective of an in-joke, the whole thing falls into place. It all really started around the time of Revolver, summer of 66. They'd just stopped touring. The last gig ever was at uh, Candlestick Park on the 29th of August. They played their last UK gig the previous December in Cardiff. Every album cover since then has betrayed Paul in a different way to the symmetry of the other three Beatles. By the time they recorded Sgt Pepper, they were spending hundreds of hours in the studio, much of it non-productive and very, very boring. Plenty of time to play around with some backwards recordings and have a little fun. And remember, Rain was released in mid-66, and that was the first taste of backwards effects. In February 67, Beatles Monthly published the denial that Paul had died in a crash. There was no conspiracy theory then. The Beatles knew that they were splitting up when Abbey Road came out. They knew it was going to be their swan song. What better time to kickstart the Paul is dead conspiracy. And up until Abbey Road, no published conspiracy theories existed. How did the myth come about? Who knows? There were no identifiable uh, originating sources. The first published Paul is Dead story came in the Iowa student newspaper written by Tim Harper and his source had heard it from an unknown musician who'd heard it from yet another unknown musician. But the myth took on a life of its own after a mystery caller found a Detroit DJ Russ Gibb and everybody heard Turn Me On Dead Man. Now Fred Labore heard that show and he wrote the article McCartney dead new evidence brought to light and he freely says he wrote it as a spoof and that he invented many of the clues himself and as a result of that article it was picked up by the national press and national tv but you look at the Beatles they more than fueled the fires of Paul is dead directly themselves John's glass onion song Ringo's I'm the greatest Paul with his covers of an empty bowl of cherries and Paul is live album with the Abbey Road sleeve parody. And maybe that was Paul finally calling time on the in joke. Now back in 1964, Paul was talking about the search for hidden meanings in Beatles work. And the whole thing is very much in the vein of John Lennon's own brand of humor. And in fact, John published his first book in his own right in 1964, Paul wrote the introduction. In it, he says, quote, There are bound to be thickheads, his word, who will wonder why some of it doesn't make sense, and others who will search for hidden meanings. And he goes on to conclude, and I quote, None of it has to make sense, and if it seems funny, then that's enough. John Lennon and Paul McCartney, what a team. Paul is dead, possibly, probably, the most sustained in-joke in rock and roll history. Well, that's it. I've been Derek Shelmerdan. You've been listening to the Rock and Roll Unravel Show and the myth that Paul is dead. I hope you've enjoyed listening to the show. If you're into social media, you can find me on Twitter at RNR Unraveled and Facebook at Rock and Roll Unraveled. Good luck with the competition. 
And don't forget, there's a very comprehensive companion blog for the show with all the clues I've talked about here, plus a whole lot more. And listen to those backwards tracks again. And you can find that at rockandrollunraveled.com. Remember, that's with two L's for unraveled. Well, join me next time for another look at Rock and Roll Unraveled. Now, to play us out, John himself told us it was all a joke. And this is the Beatles with Glass Onion. <laughs>